Well, good afternoon and thank you for joining us for this CEDA live stream. Uh, for those in the audience who don't know me, my name's Melinda Salento. I am the CEO of CEDA and I'm really pleased to be here with you this afternoon moderating today's live stream, which I'm sure is going to be uh, an interesting one and an entertaining one on this very important uh, topic. Um, I think it won't surprise those of you watching to know that CEDA um, is always trying to bring the most interesting and relevant topics and issues to our members and our audience. Um, and those issues particularly important for Australia's social and economic development. We do that through uh, events like this, our live stream series, but also through lots of other different ways, uh, podcasts, blogs, research papers, uh, and all of these are available on our website. We've been incredibly busy during this difficult crisis time, uh, and there's an incredible amount of information on our website tackling COVID-19, what it means, how we can respond to it, but also <laughs> talking about how we can um, look at uh, recovery in Australia. Um, I'd really encourage you to get uh, onto the website and have a look, cedar.com.au, uh, and have a look at all the information and content that we've got there. Today, of course, um, we've got a fantastic live stream. Um, you will be able to interact with us uh, and ask questions through our question and answer portal, uh, which is available via the link uh, below your video screen, or you can enter the details by going to cedar.pigeonhole.at and using the passcode CLIMATE. Um, we've got uh, a, quite a few speakers today. Um, so if you're looking for a response from your questions from a particular speaker, um, could I ask you to actually indicate that in your question when you log it on to Pigeonhole? So if you're looking for one of the speakers in particular to, to address your question, please let me know through Pigeonhole and I'll do my best uh, to get them to respond to that. Um, because we've got so many speakers um, and, a, and a, you know, about 30 minutes for question time, I'd like to give you the opportunity to get as involved as possible as well. So um, if you can hop onto Pigeonhole and get your questions up and running sooner rather than later, then I'll make sure we leave as much time as possible to address the issues that are on your mind. Um, before we get started, of course, um, I would like to remind you that we love it when you engage with us on social media and Twitter. Um, as always, if you can tag us in, the, in your Twitter feed at cedar underscore news. Uh, and today we're using the hashtag green recovery. Um, I would also, of course, like to acknowledge that um, wherever we are, we are meeting on Aboriginal land, uh, and I would like to pay my respects to Elders past, present uh, and emerging uh, in recognition of um, their contribution to our society today, history, uh, our history, our traditions and our cultures as a nation. Um, and... Um, just really for me personally, would like to pay my respects and, and acknowledge um, uh, elders in the spirit of reconciliation, as I said earlier. Um, it's also really important for me to thank and acknowledge our wonderful sponsors for today's event, the British High Commission uh, and Westpac. Um, we can't hold events like these without the support of our sponsors. So thank you very much um, for that. And now a warm welcome to our speakers. Uh, we have with us today uh, Nigel Topping, the High Level Climate Action Champion from the Government of the United Kingdom. Uh, the Honourable Matt Keane, New South Wales Minister for Energy and the Environment, is going to be joining us through a pre-recorded um, video. Unfortunately, he's travelling and can't be with us in person, but very much wanted to make a contribution to the conversation and discussion today. Um, and then joining us from Victoria, we've got the Honourable Lily D'Ambrosio, Victorian Minister for Energy, Environment and Climate Change and the Minister for Solar Homes. I'm not sure if that's the only one of those we have in Australia, but um, interesting to call that out. Um, it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Ingrid Southworth, who is the Acting British High Commissioner in Australia, uh, and Ingrid's going to set the scene for us uh, and then we'll move on to our other speakers. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Melinda, and to your team at CEDA for bringing this event together. I really look forward to hearing from Nigel uh, and the ministers shortly. But I thought um, I might perhaps start just by providing a little bit of context on 
COP26 and the approach that the UK is taking as we count down, in a sense, to this really important global moment. I think it, it's no exaggeration to say that sort of beyond our international work to respond to the COVID crisis, both its health and economic dimensions, really tackling climate change and, and delivering an ambitious COP26 next year is really the UK's top international priority and indeed in the sort of building back better agenda we obviously see those two priorities coming uh, together so I just wanted to recap a little bit on on COP26 obviously due to COVID itself the UN climate change conference COP26 is now taking place next year in Glasgow in November rather than this year and as the current COP26 presidency the UK in partnership with Italy, is committing to deliver a really ambitious set of outcomes at COP26. And that's really because the science is urgently dictating that, in a sense. So that means that this year we are working to build momentum for ambitious action, and in particular in light of the pandemic, how we can build back better. So how we can rebuild cleaner and more resilient economies and create the jobs uh, of the future. And, you know, of course, while governments uh, of all levels play an instrumental role in that, business uh, plays a huge role too. It's really a whole of society um, activity, activity. So businesses, advocacy for clean and resilient solutions and the choices that you as business make and for your customers and your consumers, that is a vital part I think of taking action on on climate. So as we as we head into COP26 next year, the UK uh, has set out sort of five main areas for international collaboration, and I think really across all of these, business can make a significant contribution. So the five sort of areas, and I won't sort of go into too much detail, are an energy transition. So how can we accelerate the decarbonisation of our power sector, transport? Is, a, is the second one. So how do we accelerate, in particular, the ado adoption of zero emission vehicles, so-called nature-based solutions. So that, you know, how do we protect biodiversity and natural habitats as a way of addressing climate change? And then sort of so-called adaptation and resilience. And that's really a recognition that, you know, some countries are really already facing the impacts of climate change now. And in particular, how do we support sort of more uh, fragile uh, and poorer countries help address those impacts. And that's partly why obviously the UK has doubled uh, its climate aid budget over the next five years to over 11 billion, recognising how important that strand of work is. And then I suppose underpinning all of those uh, bits of work is finance and how we can mobilise both public and private finance to enable all of that other work to take place. So as we take forward work on those things, I think it's worth just saying that you know, in a sense, I don't think there's a false choice between sort of on the one hand tackling uh, and taking climate action and on the other hand sort of economic growth and sort of recovery, obviously, in the current context. So, I mean, we are quite proud, I suppose, of the UK's record on climate. So between 1990 and 2018, the UK grew its economy by 75 percent, whilst at the same time reducing emissions by 43 percent. So I think that does show that it's possible to decouple economic growth from Emissions, And, you know, we recognise, obviously, that every country has its own starting point. But as an illustration, um, in 2012, the UK took 40% of its power was from coal, coal generation, whereas that was 2% in 2019. And last year, we, in fact, became the first uh, major economy to legislate uh, for a net zero target by 2050, which is uh, what the science tells us is it is necessary to keep to keep climate change within uh, the boundaries that the, the UN has set out. So, you know, it's clearly a really important agenda that we've got ahead of us. And building back better um, is so important at the moment in the context of COVID. So the UK government has committed domestically over $5 billion to a clean and resilient recovery. That includes a very large fund for clean transport. Uh, it includes $3 billion of investments for green building upgrades, to reduce emissions, but also obviously create jobs at the same time, and a £40 million pound clean growth fund to support tech uh, and green startups. So, you know, we believe that industry has a really significant role to play 
uh, in a green recovery through its influence, through its advocacy, and indeed the sort of agency that business has to make choices both for its customers and its own investments. So I hope some of that context is, is useful. And I'm now going to pass it to Nigel Toppy, who is much more expert than I am, um, and who, despite his British accent, will be speaking independently today as the UN's high-level climate action champion. So over to you, Nigel. <laughs> Thank you and good in, and um, good morning from 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 London. As this is the first time I've been. I've made it to the big city in six months. So it's quite exciting for me and lovely lovely to join you. And thanks to Cedar for putting on this event. Um, I mean, for me, I think it's really clear, and I, I think for all of us increasingly that COVID nineteen and climate um, are two crises that are in, very re- interrelated. They are operating on different time scales. Um, and different orders of magnitude, but they're, they're evidence of a broader crisis of fragility of our interconnectedness and, and an economic system which is operating on a footprint which is um, greater than what the scientists call the planetary boundary. So we're operating beyond um, what we know is sustainable. Uh, and and the, the, the Secretary General has described in very eloquently this, this opportunity really to uh, a need to build back better and to do so together and to use the COVID-19 recovery to prepare us for the future by, by rebooting and redesigning and transforming economic systems to build global resilience. Um, so so um, as Ingrid says, in my, my role as high-level climate action champion, I work with um, Gonzalo Munoz, who's a Chilean high-level champion in Chile, that was the president of COP25, the UK's president of COP26. Um, so we're, we're, with the, our, our task is to work with everyone who's not a government, so with the private sector, with... with, with um, um, and with local governments, so states and provinces, so, so the non-national governments. And uh, uh, a couple of months ago, we launched what we call Race to Zero to really try and galvanise all of the momentum from all of those sectors to commit to net zero as soon as possible. And I'll say a little bit more about that, but that includes um, cities, states, investors, and businesses, and already representing, um, if you add all of them, plus the countries who so far committed to net zero by 2050, um, significantly over 50% of the global economy. Um, And and increasingly, we're seeing the private sector and um, local government leaders uh, looking to federal governments to embrace the kind of approach the Secretary General laid out with his six actions for a green recovery. Um, And I have to admit, I don't understand Australian climate politics I know it's complicated and some of you understand it very well, but to the outside, to an outside, especially to the private sector um, from the outside, it, 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 it's very confusing. It looks illogical that every state and territory has some form of net zero commitment. Um, and yet uh, at the federal level, there's, uh, the, that, 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 um, that progress hasn't been made. Um, I know that's not the only country where that's the situation. Um, it, it, it increasingly seems to me that Countries like Australia are at a fork in the road. This is this is not um, it's not a trivial decision what direction an economy goes in, um, and decisions made in the next eighteen months will determine that direction. In particular, the idea of a fossil fuel led or a gas led recovery um, seems increasingly at odds with the science and with the economics. Um, especially in a country which has the resources to really be a renewable energy superpower and take advantage of the rapidly growing realisation that not only renewable energy, but the hydrogen economy is going to play a huge part in the transition to the zero carbon future with green hydrogen, green steel, green ammonia, um, with with Japan talking about the important role that ammonia will play in its economy um, in the Pacific region as as an energy carrier. We, we, Gonzalo and I have been really encouraged by the groundswell of commitments from um, non-state actors, as we call them um, in, in Australia, many of your um, big companies and some of the super funds committing to net zero recently. Uh, the way we look at this transition is that we know that industrial disruption always happens in the same way. It follows an S-curve. It doesn't seem to happen at all. And then suddenly it goes exponential. And if you're not on the S-curve, if you follow a nostalgic strategy clinging to the technology of the past, you lose out. Yesterday in the FT, 
There was an article about the oil and gas industry describing how that industry is rapidly becoming uninvestable. Actually, as a bifurcation, some of the firms are really throwing themselves into the transition. Others are um, playing a King Canute strategy, hoping that they can reverse the tide of science and, and economics. Uh, so I, I would just urge everybody here to, 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 to look at, for example, the work of the Energy Transitions Commission showing how um, how much how, how economically possible and positive the transition is. Looking at the work of the United Nations Principal Responsible Investment, describing the inevitable policy response um, and the growing evidence that uh, a fossil fuel-led recovery strategy will generate less jobs, the ratio of um, jobs created per dollar invested in the green recovery is about versus a fossil fuel is about three to one. Um, uh, and of course, the risk of stranded assets. Um, and those stranded assets, of course, will be both economic and human um, if investment is based on a desire to cling to the past. I, I, know, that, I know that you know this. Um, I know that also there's some really encouraging reports from Australia, like the AEMO um, re report recently showing that a high ambition decarbonisation, 95% um, by 2040, would deliver $40 billion of economic benefit to Australia. Uh, looking ahead to COP26, uh, countries in the region and in the world will be looking to Australia and the private sector will be looking to Australia for some signals that there's a commitment to that transition at the highest level, um, both in, in NDCs, in long-term strategies and in domestic policy. Um, so I, I look forward to uh, continuing to work with the private sector and uh, states, regions and investors all over the world and in Australia um, I, I was hoping to come to Australia during my tenure as champion. You, ne you never know, that may, still, that may still be possible, but it's wonderful to be able to join you virtually. Uh, I am very aware of the leadership of states um, such as Victoria and New South Wales. I want to thank you for that. Um, I think that um, in other areas, in other countries in the world where we see a big difference in climate um, strategy between a federal and a, and, and, and a state level, we see... Um, states who take the lead reaping the economic benefits and the job creation benefits um, of getting on with the transition. Um, uh, it, it's, I sincerely hope that a country um, with such huge resources, both natural and human in terms of the spirit of hard work and, uh, and innovation um, will emerge in the, in the months between now and COP26 as, as a regional and global leader um, and put all of those resources to bear um, in helping us accelerate the transition, the inevitable transition to the zero carbon future um, where all communities around the world prosper. Thank you. Well, thanks um, for those opening comments, Nigel. Um, there's certainly a lot in there that I'm sure we're gonna come back to in the Q and A. Um, we've got a poll open as well uh, through our pigeonhole um, Link, uh, if you haven't already responded and you're watching this, please get in there and give us your views on, on the poll questions. Um, we're getting some questions through from the audience as well. Um, I'm looking forward to more of those. Otherwise, you're just going to hear me talking a lot, which um, is less enjoyable than me talking about your questions. Um, but now, um, as I said at the outset, um, the Honourable Matt Keane was very keen to be a part of this conversation but couldn't be here um, at this time. So we do have um, a pre-recorded contribution from him. So we'll move to that now before he hearing from um, our Victorian Minister. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Can I thank Cedar for the opportunity to speak to you? I'd like to acknowledge the other speakers today, Lily D'Ambrosio, Victoria's Energy, Environment and Climate Change Minister, Ingrid Southworth, Acting British High Commissioner to Australia, and Nigel Topping, the UK's High Level Climate Action Champion. I'd like to particularly acknowledge and thank Nigel Topping for asking me to speak today. Nigel is leading the outstanding work of the UK Government to bring together nations at COP26 next year. COP26 will be one of the most important global summits in 2021, and an opportunity for nations to showcase ideas on accelerating climate action and prospering in a low carbon world. This year has been literally like no other in living memory. COVID-19 has completely upended our way of life. Some of our state borders have closed. Curfews, lockdowns and social distancing have been imposed to contain the spread of the coronavirus. 
These are difficult policies alien to our idea of a shared inclusive society. These drastic measures to contain the spread of the virus and keep the public safe have hurt our economy. Many companies have deferred investment and deals. Many have been forced to lay off staff. Others have closed their doors. It is the biggest economic shock in peacetime since the 1930s. The next and even bigger challenge will be how to rebound the economy from this deep recession, to get our country back to work. Rebuilding the nation, Australians have faced challenges like this before, and generation after generation of Australians has risen to the challenge of their time. Our great-grandparents, the Anzac generation, forged a nation on the beachheads of Gallipoli and on the sodden fields of the Somme. They managed our country through the poverty of the Great Depression. Our grandparents defended the country from foreign attack during the Second World War. They endured the horrors of the battlefield, the deprivations and curfews and rationing, and then returned to rebuild the country in the post-war period. Our own parents lived through the Cold War, staring down the tyranny of the Soviet Union for the freedoms we enjoy and, the imagine, and imagined a freer, more liberal economy, which laid the foundation for the longest period of uninterrupted economic growth of any developed country in the modern era. Time and time again, generations of Australians have guided the nation through the crises of their time to a more prosperous future. And they have done that by building for the future. After the First World War, the Anzac generation delivered Bradfield's grand vision. They built the Harbour Bridge, a feat of engineering steel and stone which has framed Sydney for nearly a century. After the Second World War, our grandparents pursued one of the country's most iconic pieces of infrastructure, the Snowy Hydro Scheme. Even today, Snowy Hydro epitomises the value of nation building done right. It created jobs for 100,000 workers and has delivered reliable, clean electricity into our homes and businesses for decades. It's a project that took a quarter of a century to build, but will pay back future generations for centuries. It was the type of visionary investment in our future, and it is the model for how we should think about the economic challenges we currently face. If we are going to borrow vast sums from future generations, we need to invest it in future generations. I don't want to see our children paying interest on our debt. I want to see our children earning a return on our investment. If we want to repay future generations, then we have to start building for their future. We have to create jobs, pull the economy out of recession, and leave an infrastructure legacy for our kids, one that they're proud we had the foresight to build. Climate and energy is an area where we can invest for the future. We also need to focus our reconstruction investment on areas that are going to play to our strengths and our emerging competitive strengths. One of those areas is in low carbon emission industries. The rest of the world is moving on climate change. More than half the wealth created in the world comes from jurisdictions that have signed up to reach net zero emissions by 2050. At the same time, some of the biggest companies in the world like Volkswagen and BHP have committed to net zero emissions across their own businesses and all along the supply chains. Major fossil fuel companies like Shell and Woodside are also shifting their focus from oil and gas to renewable electricity and hydrogen. Recent history shows that those who innovate and grasp this change, not resist it, can upend entire industries, capture markets, and create value in a way that few of their peers can match. The best example of this is Tesla, which has gone from a startup pioneer of electric vehicles to the most valuable car company in the US. There are also real risks of doing nothing. If we don't move, then Australia could find itself on the wrong side of megatrends like rising carbon-based protectionism, while other economies steal our march in new clean industries. We should be using this recovery to build those industries here, not because it's good for the environment, but because it's good for the economy and it's good for the prosperity of future generations of Australians. The most exciting development in low carbon technology over the past decade has been the dramatic fall in the cost of renewable energy. Solar PV has evolved from being a high cost specialist technology to landing on one in four roofs in Australia. It is literally everywhere. We also need renewables at a utility scale. Which is why earlier this year I announced a $110 million program to develop the country's first coordinated renewable energy zone in the Central West and New England areas. Renewable energy zones are modern day power stations and an efficient way to coordinate our natural energy resources. But as we all know, renewables are only part of the solution. We use energy all the time, but renewables produce it only some of the time. During cold, dark and still weeks in the dead of winter, we're in the early evenings of summer heat waves. Electricity supply is already tight. Solar and wind alone cannot keep the lights on. They need help. We need to be more able to store the electricity they create and use it later. 
Our modern grid will need layers of electricity storage. Technologies like fast start batteries can move energy from daytime to evenings or sunny days to cloudy days. It will also need what experts call deep storage, vast reservoirs of energy that we can call on at any time of the day. The best technology to provide this deep storage is pumped hydro. Pumped hydro uses water as a battery, reversing the flow of its turbines to push water uphill when renewable energy is abundant and releasing it when it's not. Pumped hydro can keep the electricity system going because when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, water can still run down the hill. New South Wales is well placed to be the home of more pumped hydro. In fact, there are about 20,000 reservoirs across New South Wales suited to build pumped hydro. That's an enormous opportunity right on our doorstop and one that the Morrison government has already recognised with its world leading plans for Snowy 2.0. Pumped hydro fits the mould of what a nation rebuild should look like. Currently the Snow, Snowy Mountains region is a hive of jobs and growth. Towns are being revitalised and investment is flowing into the region in levels not seen since the original Snowy Hydro scheme was built. Over the course of the project, Snowy 2.0 will create 4,000 jobs over the life of the project and help to drive regional New South Wales out of its recession. I want to see that potential unleashed across more of New South Wales. Even with the great work happening at Snowy, New South Wales is going to need at least another 2 gigawatts of deep storage like pumped hydro to modernise our grid. And if we build it, we could create another 1,100 1, construction jobs and invest in our state. These projects are really capital intensive and deliver over, delivered over generations. Many of the best sites for pumped hydro in New South Wales are still owned by government. Now is the time for government and the private sector to partner together to deliver our pumped hydro potential. We need to work harder and smarter to expand our best reservoirs into giant batteries. Experience here in Australia and overseas shows that developing pumped hydro on dams works, adding valuable megawatts to the grid without compromising long-term water security. We need to provide long-term certainty for investors so that they can make long-term investments in these long-term projects. More certainty for investments, investors means less risk, allowing private capital to invest at lower energy prices for consumers. Other sectors of the economy, and of course energy, is only one part of the story. Earlier this week, I released the Chief Scientist report into the opportunities for New South Wales in a low carbon economy. In that report, the Chief Scientist found that considering decarbonisation and building climate resilience in COVID-19 stimulus is critical to maximise the economic benefits of that investment. He identified 65 economic opportunities across key sectors of the state's economy. The Chief Scientist report gives the foundation to what sustainable stimulus could look like. Borrowing to fast track new hydrogen projects and new low emissions industrial precincts. Removing the barriers to electrification of cars with a strategic rollout of EV charges around the state. Working with our major industries to help them transition manufacturing to low emissions processes. Working with our regions to generate multi-billion dollar incomes from carbon farming to building the renewable energy zones to power the economy of the future. Now, more than ever, governments of all sizes and colours should look closely at this advice and find ways to rebuild our country into a smarter, cleaner and more resilient place. One that can make the most of its competitive advantages in a rapidly changing world. We are entering a critical phase of our economic history and we need to be bold, decisive and focused on the future. That is the approach Australians have taken in the past, and they have faced challenges like those we face today. After the Second World War, our grandparents had to rebuild the nation. They embraced the future, opened the country to immigrants and markets, and were rewarded with a post-war economic boom that created the modern Australia we live in today. Theirs was a generation that rose to the challenge of the times. Now is the time for our generation to do exactly the same. Well, two interesting perspectives already to start our uh, conversation going. Um, it's my great pleasure now to welcome um, Minister D'Ambrosio to give us a perspective from Victoria, and then of course we'll open for questions. So if you've got some questions, please get them in now. Uh, and then over to you, Lily, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Melina. Can I also uh, acknowledge uh, all of the, the wonderful guests here uh, today, uh, starting with um, 
uh, well, importantly, uh, before I acknowledge guests, is to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all gathered right across uh, the country. Uh, and in particular, uh, where I am located is on the land of the Wurundjeri people uh, here in the northern uh, parts of uh, Melbourne and Victoria. Uh, my acknowledgement, of course, to Matt Keane, uh, the New South Wales Minister for Energy and Environment, Nigel Topping, high-level climate action champion of the UK government, uh, and, of course, others uh, who are with us uh, from the uh, British High Commission. Uh, and to all of you, uh, uh, my, uh, my, my contribution today is very much uh, uh, aligned with the, the real eagerness of all of us here today, understanding the urgency of action on climate. Uh, and my message is very clear, that uh, the community, society, businesses, the economy, if you like, right across our country and no less so in Victoria have made up their minds about what we need to do uh, on climate change to tackle uh, the real threat uh, to our livelihoods, uh, to our economic well-being, uh, and what society looks like. Governments need to keep up. Uh, they need to catch up. Uh, and when we talk about uh, the importance of a, a whole of economy uh, set of changes that we need to activate uh, if we are to achieve what we need to to keep global warming below uh, what the uh, climate change scientist tells us. We also need to understand that equal to that is the need for the whole of the society to come along with us. Uh, and governments absolutely cannot afford to abrogate their responsibilities uh, to do that to bring communities with us because the social licence is there. We need to ensure that communities are able to travel the journey that they want to travel on uh, together so that we can ensure that people are not left behind no matter where they live. That is really, really critical here. Uh, what I do want to say is that um, our government uh, has very much nailed our colours to the mast when it comes to climate change. We've legislated for net zero emissions to be achieved by 2050, not just legislate uh, the target for 2050, but legislated a requirement on governments to uh, demonstrate through uh, and lead through interim emissions reduction targets on a five yearly basis. And that means that we provide the certainty to industry, the economy, to the broader community to understand where we are going in five yearly periods of time so that investment decisions can be made with the certainty of the emissions reductions that we need to achieve in those five yearly periods so that we're not waiting for 2050 or close to 2050 to realise, well, this is the gap that we've got to make up for. No, we need to understand and, and have the ambition, uh, the reality, but also the ambition uh, to be able to harness the will right across our society uh, and economy to actually get things done. So our emissions reduction targets, uh, as I said, through legislation, uh, are set at net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, right now, uh, my government uh, is in the throes of finalising what our emissions reduction targets will be for 2025 and 2030. Now, the importance of that is that they will be backed up by budget decisions that will be made later this year so that we will actually have those interim targets set in place uh, that the that industry businesses in our state can be sure about what those targets will be so that they can make their adjustments, understanding where government will be in terms of its budget decision making and how communities fit into that is really critical. Underpinning those, of course, is a lot of serious work that is, that is going on in the sector pledges uh, that we need to focus on uh, for us to be able to achieve not just our interim targets, but finally our uh, target in 2050. So not only will we be setting those interim emissions targets uh, by uh, the end of this year, we will have uh, a budget consideration that goes to uh, the various pledges that we will be making in important sectors that include uh, energy, include uh, transport, uh, industrial processes, agriculture, and uh, Lulu CF. Uh, they are critical areas where we need to make the big strides uh, for us to be successful uh, in this. And all of this speaks to transition. 
uh, managing a transition that ensures that every part of our community, every part of our society is not left behind but play an important role in getting to what effectively is uh, and has to be a responsibility that is shared across all of us. But no responsibility can ever really succeed uh, if it lies only within the private sector or if it lies only within the public sector or if it lies only amongst uh, the number of and, and the hundreds of thousands of members of the community that are taking their own actions at local levels. The combined effort has to be there, it has to be proportionate, and there must be government leadership that shows the way to make it all come together. Uh, and that is the confidence. That is about instilling confidence for businesses to make investment decisions, for communities to say, yes, we can do this. And whatever their efforts are as local communities, no matter where they are in the, in the state, they will actually add up to a greater global effort. Uh, everyone has a role to play, no matter how many emissions reductions uh, they bring to, uh, to the equation. And I'll say to you that uh, we have a, a fantastic um, uh, number of uh, leaders here in our state uh, at a government level, but also importantly at the business level. For the first time, I think, in our state, we had uh, last year uh, a group coming together that represented business, industry, uh, the unions, uh, welfare organisations, so the AIG, VTHC, VCOS, coming together, Friends of the Earth, uh, Environment Victoria, coming together, uh, pledging their commitment to uh, strong uh, climate change targets and a commitment to work together to achieve those, but ensuring that communities and businesses uh, are not left behind. So we're about harnessing that and collectively making the changes that we need to do. If I may just touch on some of the, the really important changes that we've already made in our state. Uh, we uh, certainly um, have got a very strong renewable energy target of uh, achieving 50% of renewable energy generation uh, in our state by 2030. That's in legislation. I think we're probably the only state, uh, the only jurisdiction in the, in the country that has a legislated target to do that. Uh, and I'm very pleased that uh, we had Australia's largest uh, renewable energy auction uh, that was held back in 2017. Uh, we went out with for 650 megawatts of new generation build in our state. We got just under 1,000 uh, megawatts that are now locked into contracts. Uh, on the back of uh, another uh, VRET, uh, VRET um uh, auction that we announced just last week, another 600 megawatts, which will go to ensuring that all of the government's own energy needs are met from renewable energy. Uh, we have already had uh, hundreds of inquiries globally, globally to take part in that process. Uh, these are about jobs too, great jobs, good jobs that are shared right across our state. And the biggest beneficiaries uh, in our state so far from our large-scale renewable energy uh, targets have been regional Victorians, the farmers, the ones that supplement their income because their land uh, sometimes is not as productive as it can be uh, from season to season, especially going into drought periods, which we know are just going to grow as, as a real problem and a challenge. They are really important projects providing much-needed jobs. We know that just through our 50% renewable energy target, we are going to be creating about 26,000 jobs between now and 2030, real good jobs in the new energy technology sector. Uh, we are also, of course, uh, uh, understanding that doing, uh, uh, doing more so that we actually use less power is so much a part of the equation. Often energy efficiency, energy productivity is seen as the poorer cousin. It can't be seen as the poorer cousin because often it's the most cost efficient way of driving down emissions. Uh, in Victoria, we've got uh, the most, uh, uh, the strongest form of uh, uh, energy efficiency white certificate scheme in the country. Uh, it's driving down uh, millions of tonnes uh, of emissions uh, each and every year. And I'm actually looking forward to announcing what our new targets will be for further reductions uh, in emissions uh, as we get closer to the end of this year. Again, supporting about 2,000 jobs uh, in Victoria and really driving down power bills for households and for businesses in our state. Uh, we know that there's a lot more that has to be done. Uh, we have 
uh, right now, I'm really pleased to say that I, together with uh, the Transport Minister in Victoria, are working on uh, an electric vehicles uh, roadmap uh, that will be released uh, later this year. This will be a complement, of course, to the transport sector pledge. Uh, and ultimately, by the end of this year, we will have announced what our interim reduction, uh, sorry, our interim uh, emissions reduction pledges will be for 2025 and 2030. Uh, I do want to say that uh, uh, absolutely transport and the situation that we've got with the global pandemic and COVID. It is no different to what was experienced uh, during the global financial crisis. We know that the smart uh, jurisdictions, the smart businesses, the smart economies, the smart societies understood that as a brilliant opportunity uh, to actually uh, turn about the investment that was going to follow that, of course, communities look to governments and, and, and businesses to inject into the economy to, uh, economy to revive the economy, saw that and used that as a, a, a wonderful opportunity to on the road to decarbonising uh, our society and our economy. Uh, the, glo the, the coronavirus, the COVID-19 uh, problem that we've got uh, globally, but of course in Australia and Victoria no less, uh, presents us with another opportunity. Uh, we don't like to have these as opportunities, but when they are there, we need to consider the fact that there are going to there is going to be record investment uh, by governments. Uh, our premier has made it very very clear that we will see coming out of the second wave of COVID that we're experiencing right now in Victoria, uh, we will have a government that will um, will uh, make announcements that will lead to uh, investment that will not have been seen in, in this state ever before. Uh, and this will be about also maximising, optimising the opportunities for decarbonising our economy. Make no mistake about that. Uh, the announcements that we made last week on our renewable energy uh, next auction, if you like, of VRED, uh, did not come by accident. It came as a very strong signal of what recovery will look like in our state. It's one feature of it. It's not the only feature. Uh, as I said, uh, there is more that will be said in terms of transport, in terms of agriculture, uh, in terms of uh, the way that land use is managed. Uh, we have a significant uh, set of commitments already out there on the way on reducing waste uh, in our community, targets for reducing uh, the production of waste. Re, the creation of waste, but also recycling, getting organic materials out of landfill. Those are the types of initiatives that we will that will help to drive significant reductions in emissions. The clean tech jobs that come from that in Victoria is uh, is very very strongly supported by more than three hundred million dollars of investment just in these four years that we've put aside. For, for the waste and resource recovery sector. So there are many opportunities there. Uh, our uh, ambition is very strong. Our ambition is to make and to keep Victoria as not only the renewable energies hub of the country, uh, driving down those ad emissions, having robust reduction in emissions, and, but creating all of those clean tech jobs uh, that will be lasting jobs that will actually turn around and reform uh, what, our, what industry looks like uh, in our state. Our community is with us, they support us, uh, and we know that uh, when Victoria once grew and became the nation's manufacturing hub on the back of cheap uh, coal-fired power generation, and it served our state absolutely well and many other states absolutely well for many, many decades, the cheap gas that we got offshore uh, really uh, fueled uh, the prosperity. And I think it's important for us to remember that because when we remember that, we understand what is capable for us to underpin the future of manufacturing, the future of heating for communities, the future of a resilient and thriving economy when we think about those low emissions uh, technologies, those low emission fuels, those low emissions uh, electricity sources. So um, my message is really clear. Uh, Victoria, uh, Victoria's prosperity will be underpinned by cheap, affordable, clean energy, uh, by clever, clean tech ways 
of running our economy uh, that will create those jobs, that will drive down those emissions. Uh, and we will hold ourselves as a government to account every step of the way with those interim reduction targets. Uh, finally, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to say a few words. I know I've gone over time. Mm -hmm. I will stop there uh, and, uh, and hand it back over to you, Melina. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. No, that's, thanks for that. And, um, you know, I think everyone who's watching understands the, the commitment and the um, enthusiasm and passion you bring to these commitments on, on behalf of your, your government. Um, I'm, what I'm going to do now is just quickly run through the response to the poll because I think it actually sets some colour and frameworks, if you like, for the conversation we can have in the Q&A. Um, so the question that we asked uh, the audience was, uh, which do you think is the top priority for accelerating the decline of carbon intensive industries. 6% um, of the audience said global agreements and commitments. 14% uh, uh, highlighted global, uh, sorry, government investment in new technologies and renewables. 12% uh, said direct capital flows and the encouragement of private sector investment. So roughly sort of 12, 14 for government support and private sector and a fully 68% uh, said a cohesive energy policy that delivers a clear plan. Nigel, if you if you want an answer to um, trying to understand what's been going on, I think you've got it there in the sense that there is a degree of um, anxiety perhaps around um, uh, what's happened with energy policy here in this country. Um, it has been a little bit topsy-turvy to say, uh, <laughs> say it lightly. Um, but let me draw you into this conversation around the, the importance of global agreements. Um, and with only 6% of people thinking that that's critical to sort of decarbonising, um, I'm interested in your perspective, not least because I feel like it's been one of the issues that's been used as a reason for why we haven't pushed harder domestically. Um, so I'm interested in that. And then there's a very specific question around um, how do net zero commitments from the Australian private sector shape up against what you're seeing from in commitments from industry in other jurisdictions? Um, great. Well, can I first of all say it's re I'm really inspired to listen to um, Ministers Keane and D'Ambrosia and a um, combination of passion and pragmatism. Um, and, and we're very aligned, right? So that's really, that, that's really encouraging. Um, I think the global versus local question is a good one. Uh, uh, first of all, COP26 is not a renegotiation of targets between countries. Some, it's sometimes misportrayed as that. It's, it won't be a renegotiation of a new grand international deal. The multilateral piece of COP26 is the finalisation of the rule book of the Paris Agreement, some of the details which are important. So I, I think your audience has pretty much <clears throat> got, it, got it right. It's much more around um, national and local jurisdictions. And again, country by country, the, the, the balance of policy powers varies between national and local, I know, um, and, and private sector. What what, what Gonzalo and I call the ambition loop. You know, as, as private sector gets more ambitious, it, it makes it easier for governments to be bolder. As governments are bolder, it, it, it raises the, um, the, the, the floor for the private sector, and we go, we go around that more and more. I, I think it does depend by, by sector, right? Some, sometimes, some sectors are very prone to what we call carbon leakage. You'll see, in, you'll see in Europe, for example, at the moment, there's a very serious conversation about... A, a border adjustment tax. The idea there being to beware of, like, for example, driving the cement industry to decarbonise um, in one jurisdiction, and then finding that you just push the industry over the over the border. So I think even though you don't need global agreements, you, you might need sort of fiscal measures to, to 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 prevent a sort of perverse outcome where you by trying to drive down, you actually drive away, which ends up being bad for environment and bad for jobs and bad for the economy. I think gen generally speaking, what we're seeing now increasingly is alignment around sectoral pathways. So we mentioned hydrogen, um, same in shipping. There's a huge coalition called Getting to Zero working on how do we decarbonize shipping, um, starting to converge around the pathway in the next five and 10 years. As Minister D'Ambrosio said, it's not just the target in 2040 or 2050. It's what are we going to do in the next five years in terms of investment? So I, I think the, that's where for me, we've seen the balance of, Thinking and collaboration is the multiple stakeholders coming together around the, 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 the sectoral pathways in cement, in steel, in shipping, in hydrogen, et cetera. And the, the, the global deal, of course, the most important part of the Paris Agreement in many ways was that it, it recognised the sovereignty of nations and said each nation must do its best 
and then this five-year ratchet. So um, that's really what, what what everyone's looking to nation states now is where's your ratchet? How you know, given the the science has only got grimmer and the economics only more positive, uh, let's let's up your game, please, as you promised to do when you became a signatory to the Paris Agreement. Yeah, I think it's um, it's a point very well made around the, the sort of it's, it's it's not a target off in the future that we're just going to you know hope will hit and and the way you're sort of talking about the different sectors and the different approaches because you know one of the questions that I that we've got through in the pigeonhole is really responding I think to Minister Keane's focus on things like pumped hydrogen and I think one of the challenges is when you when you're trying to get people to focus on what's possible. Um, and the fact that you can you can shift to new technologies, you can find new sources uh, of energy, et cetera, um, in that sort of aspirational sense that um, that becomes the focus. And the question I had from one of the audience members was, you know, pumped hydro, is that going to be enough? And I think what I'm hearing from both you and Minister D'Ambrosio is that, no, this is a multifaceted approach. It's a stage-stepped approach. Um, yes, we're talking about hydrogen because there's great opportunity there, but there is there is so much more to it. I'm wondering if I can if I can bring the minister in and actually talk to both of you about also this role that about around energy efficiency and you know if you're looking at developed developing countries which I know Nigel's really focused focus for you in the UK uh, you and your UN role but also the UK government is around you know helping them continue to advance in development whilst dealing with the decarbonisation. So perhaps first to you, Minister D'Ambrosio, just talk about um, efficiency, but then interested uh, from your, your perspective there as well, Nigel. Uh, look, thank you. Um, look, energy efficiency certainly is, uh, I think I called it the poorer cousin because often it's seen as uh, not very sexy. Uh, people like to uh, talk about renewable energy as the generation side rather than, you know, the, the uh, uh, doing more with less energy, which is really what energy efficiency is all about. I mean, we, we know that... Um, uh, Australia and, and Victoria similarly, um, it, we, it's been a double-edged sword. I mean, we've had many, many decades where, as I said earlier, we've had a lot of cheap electricity. We've had a lot of uh, uh, cheap gas, especially in Victoria. And I think for for for, for Nigel, uh, understanding Victoria's got uh, uh, is is a bit of a, a one-off in, in or a standout in some ways of the rest of the country because. We have we've had over the decades a greater reliance on a combination of gas and electricity, uh, especially for gas to, to heat our homes in the winter. So we've got a particular challenge now. Others would in, in past decades would have seen that as a, a good thing, but now in terms of decarbonisation, it, it presents some challenges. But but um, the, the important thing here is that the housing stock, if you like, uh, right across the country, because you actually had very cheap fuel and electricity. There wasn't a lot of thought put into actually making our homes energy efficient because that the, the, the cost factor uh, was never a great motivator in uh, how the, the thermal efficiency of a home uh, and to raise those standards. So we've got, as a result, unlike probably many parts of Europe where the cost factor has been an important driver for thermal efficiency, uh, we, we're, we're actually quite behind. And, and that's why we've got to keep striving for uh, ensuring that uh, as governments, uh, we, we put the right incentives and continue to focus on the incentives that are about reducing uh, the, the reliance on, on energy per se. And uh, uh, we, we're going to hopefully have some really important things to say in terms of uh, energy efficiency for homes uh, as we work through our way through through um, some of the stimulus uh, arrangements that we are working on as we get out of uh, out of the COVID situation. So that's one really uh, cost effective way of achieving significant uh, reductions in in emissions. Yeah, I, I mean it's interesting, Minister D'Ambrosi, you, you talk about the thermal efficiency. Deficit. I mean, um, not dissimilar in, in the UK actually. And so, part of the UK, part of the UK government's plans are, uh, um, in terms of the COVID recovery, are a, are a big retrofit push. Um, and I, and I think there are many parts of the world where that's the case. Um, um, and of course, that that's a that's a double whammy because there's a huge job, huge short term job creation. You know, you can create jobs very quickly by. Um, Either, either mandating ma and or supporting a, a retrofit investment. And of course, that also then reduces the operating 
cost and improves the health of, of, of buildings. You know, we, you know, I mean, old, I mean, old people living in thermally inefficient buildings are much, you know, uh, it's damaging to their health. So I think the, the retrofit seems to be uh, encouragingly emerging as one of the key um, sort of arrows in the in, in government quiver um, when it comes to green recovery. The other thing I would say in terms of energy efficiency, of course, one of the challenges is that it's it's not big chunks of infrastructure; it's very distributed. But the there are, there, are, there are big things which government can do, again, as, as both ministers said, to provide certainty and a direction for innovation when it comes to standards and procurement. And actually, um, India is one of the, the, the standouts. You know, the Indian government's done an amazing job of um, accelerating innovation by sending a strong enough signal to the market um, uh, in several technologies to really really drive the cost down very quickly. And, that, and in some cases, that's also an opportunity in, the, in emerging markets to leapfrog um, old technology and go, go 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 straight to new technology. I mean, we sometimes forget that um, electrifying transport is also a big efficiency play, right? Because electric motors are much more efficient. So again, there's a leapfrog opportunity um, in many parts of the world who maybe don't have such a big combustion engine fleet rather than go to combustion engine and then trans, tra transform to electric. They can, they can go much quicker to electric. Thanks for that. Now, uh, we've got about five minutes to go. I'm hoping, I'm looking for some nods. I'm hoping we can run just a few minutes over, if that's all right. Absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to stay. And yeah. um, I'm, I'm just going to ignore my, my tech team and just plough ahead with this. Um, I'm going to ask you, another, you. a quick question for you. Uh, it was, it's a very quick question, of course. I've got a question from the audience around, um, uh, you've both mentioned gas. Um, future of gas in decarbonisation and, you know, what, what you think this, the, the answer is there? Who goes first? Well, Nigel Doesn't... can go first. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Nigel can go first, yeah. From a global perspective, I'd be interested in Nigel's views and then, Minister, happy for you to jump in as well, of course. Yeah, look, I think, I mean, the Energy Transitions Commission, which I used to sit on, is going to be review, doing a revised report on the sort of pathways for um Heavy industry and um, and 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 power. Um, it, it, I think this. I think in the next week or two. So that I'd be interested to see that. I mean, there's no doubt that gas has a role, right? We're not. We can't switch off gas tomorrow, because then we'd be. We wouldn't be heating homes, and we wouldn't be um, driving. You know, particularly high temperature thermal processes in industry. Um, I think the the question is about um, the risk of investing in additional gas infrastructure which um, risks then becoming stranded within its within the um, amortization period and therefore being a, a financial hit on public and private balance sheets. Um, and I think I, I would just be particularly wary of um, optimistic assumptions around CCS being added to gas. Remember that in most parts of the world, um, fossil fuels are already on a levelized basis cheaper uh, Renewables are already cheaper than fossil fuels. And, and of course, that's only going in one direction because we know the costs for every bit of the renewable energy system, the, the generation, the storage, and the demand response management, the interconnectors is going down. So there's no doubt that gas has a role. The, the question is one of risk management and be very wary about um, strategies which envisage significant new investments in gas infrastructure, which... A, will not create the jobs that investments in renewables uh, 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 will, um, and B, risk being stranded within the planned life, life cycle of the, of the technology. Minister? Yeah, yes, thank you. Look, I, I, I actually wouldn't disagree at all with, with anything that, that Nigel said. Um, we, we do need to take care uh, about um, uh, some calls uh, uh, to, to, to really switch off gas and, and we're just not in a position to do that. And, and, and one thing that we need to really be mindful of is that uh, how we see it. I mean, for a number of years, people have talked about gas as a transition fuel. It's probably, you could probably still describe it as such, but probably over a shorter period of time, but it will still have a distinct and probably a more specialised role to play uh, than what it has uh, up until now. So uh, I think it's going to be really important for people to understand that in terms of an, a, a power generation system, that um, that it's 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 a it, it is a uh, a uh, tool, if you like, or or. Um, uh, one option for firming capacity um, uh, for peaking 
uh, and that is really going to be important now. Um, and I think it's going to be important for us to un actually understand what is the emissions profile uh, of certain amount of gas power generation for during peaking periods that are really about uh, sustaining and, and firming up a broader array of renewable energy sources that you've got in, in your system. Uh, and I think you, many people would actually be pleasantly surprised to find that uh, the emissions outcomes are likely to be really, really low. Now, that, that, that depends on, you know, what, what role you think gas will play uh, in an energy, uh, in an electricity generation sense. If you're looking at it as a firming um, option, uh, for, as a peaking um, uh, option, then uh, you, you will see when you compare it year to year against other fossil fuels uh, in the energy market that uh, it is actually really very low in terms of output. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that that is a, a reason not to press ahead uh, at the rate that people expect us to and that we can uh, efficiently towards renewable energy, uh, knowing what the end goal needs to be. In terms of um, uh, the reliance of, by, of industry uh, that utilises gas and still will need it as a feedstock. This is really critical here, and that's where a lot of the focus on hydrogen uh, will can very much come in on it of its own, if you like. That's still going to be some time away, uh, but uh, our state very much supports the need for us to drive further research and uh, and development uh, in, in in green. Uh, hydrogen, uh, so that we can potentially see any surplus of renewable energy generation that we can get, and, and with very strong ambition, uh, why wouldn't you look at why wouldn't you look at creating surplus of power that you can actually store in hydrogen that can be used at other times uh, of the day and and for other purposes. So uh, very much supportive of Nigel's view of the world on that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Nigel, I'm going to give you um, the last two minutes, if that's okay. And I'm going to ask you this question, which is, in a, if you could perfectly put forward what Australia would do to support what you're trying to do um, as a climate action champion through the UN, what would it be? Well, First of all, first of all, a lot of Australians are doing this already. And again, I'm really encouraged. I love the way the minister describes that kind of whole of society, you know, um, government, business, investors, civil society coming together around the kind of sectoral transition. So um, I think keep doing that and enroll more people. The more that the more that the world knows that every state in Australia, um, you know, the, the, the big super funds like Hester and First State, who recently committed to, be, to being net zero, you know, the, 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 the big Australian um companies that are known around the world, but, but also the ones that are not known around the world. So the, the more there's a signal from every part of society in Australia that Australia as a society is on the move, because a lot of people don't hear that. They hear the federal um, uh, music. Um, uh, and, that's, and, that, and that's, as I say, that can be confusing. So um, just do a lot more and, then, and, 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 and good luck on converging that um, at a federal level, if there's anything I could do to help, I'd be delighted to. But um, I, you know, I think uh, it is about the whole of society. It is about certainty for investment. It is about focusing on the jobs of the future and our our, our economic responsibility to the generations of the future, as well as as well as our moral responsibility to to to, to, to the environment, to the natural world, and the generations of today. So. I, I don't think Australia as a society needs to wake up or make a big right turn. I think, please keep on doing more. The evidence is only getting stronger that this is the only way to recover. Um, and I, I'm really delighted to hear so much positivity and clear thinking um, from, my, from my fellow speakers. And, and, and I just applaud your, your leadership and encourage you to, do, to just to keep, keep pushing, be bold, and, and we will get to Glasgow with a very strong sense globally that global society has decided to move to net zero, decided that it's in our mutual and future generations mutual interest and that together we will get there. So thank you. Thank you so much. And that's a, a pretty strong way for us to, to finish, I think. I'm sorry we're, we are out of time and it is Friday afternoon, so I'm assuming that there's other interests calling many of our viewers. Um, can I thank each of our speakers, Minister D'Ambrosio, Nigel, um, for bringing the UN sort of perspective uh, to us. It was nice also to hear from Minister Keane from New South Wales. 
Um, I think if I can close out by saying one of the key themes that was coming through some of the questions was really just around how we deal with, with this challenge of climate change in the context of the current crisis that we're in. I think what we've seen today is a minister from Victoria who, you know, obviously I'm in Victoria, it's a state that has plenty of challenges at the moment, but one has made the time to come and uh, present the, her government's position, um, outline a series of really clear commitments um, and really a focus on how we can use this transition to generate new activity and, and jobs. So I think um, doing that and bringing the community is really the clear message that we've got from, from today. Can I also thank uh, Ingrid Southworth for being involved uh, with us today um, and, of course, thank our sponsors, the British High Commission and Westpac, for helping us to bring this conversation to such a great audience. Um, and thank you to the audience for being uh, involved and sending your questions through. We will leave Pigeonhole open. If you've got some questions, keep putting them through. We'll get some answers for you and, and email those out to all of our viewers today. And finally, of course, what I'd love to do is draw your attention to the fact that we're not stopping here this afternoon. Next week, we've got another fantastic live stream on a really topical issue, the future of the higher education sector here in Australia. Um, if you've got time, please get onto our website, cedar.com.au, to register with that. Um, and while you're there, please take the opportunity to listen to a podcast recorded with our Chief Economist, Jared Ball, um, as he talks to the CEO of the Front Project, Jane Hunt, about this really challenging issue around childcare and affordability in Australia and how we can make some changes to the childcare subsidy here uh, and support here in Australia to support women getting back to work in recovery. Thank you again for your uh, time today. Thank you again to our speakers and to our sponsors, the British High Commission and Westpac. Have a fantastic